Consider the group Z6. Here is a group table for Z6, and this was the group of um, the numbers uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 under addition mod 6. And the question that I want to ask is, what is the smallest subgroup that contains the element 2? So let's think about this. If it contains the element 2, well, then we can say for this subgroup that we're definitely going to have 2, okay? And let's see, if it has 2, by closure, it would have to have 2 plus 2. And 2 plus 2 in this case is 4, so we know 4 would have to be in there. And if it uh, also has uh, closure, again, we can apply this. So we would have 2 plus 2 plus 2. Uh, we can think of it as 2 plus 2 plus 2, which we know is in the group, the subgroup. And so that's the same as 2 plus 4. And so 2 plus 4 is 6, but instead of 6, we would say 0. Okay, so we have 0 in here. And let's try it one more time. How about if we had 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2? Okay, well, 2 plus 2 plus 2, that's what we had above here. And we saw that that was the same thing as 0. And 2 plus 0 is 2, and we already have 2. And so if we keep going with this, uh, adding 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, then we would end up back at 4, and then we would end up back at 0. We would be kind of cycling through everything here. So I think this would be our subgroup right here. Uh, we have an identity element, 0, and we have closure. We saw how that worked right here, and you can check the other properties. Uh, but this is indeed a subgroup that contains the element 2. So if we have Z6, we saw that we had a subgroup H, which consisted of 0, 2, and 4. And the idea was we took an element of the group and we repeatedly applied the binary operation, which in this case was addition mod 6. Well, here's a question. Does this always generate a subgroup? So before we answer this, let's look at some notation. Suppose G is a group and A is an element of G then we're gonna use these uh, little brackets here to represent this idea of all of the powers of that element where n is some integer. This is sort of what we were doing before. We were using additive notation with the group Z6 because that was more appropriate. Uh, if I were gonna write this using additive notation, I could put the a in the brackets here, and then I could say instead of a to the n, n times a, where n is some integer and this would be using additive notation. That's what we were doing with Z6. Um, so the question is, if we just take powers or multiples, depending on what notation we're using, uh, of this element A, do we get a subgroup? So here was the, uh, this notation that we've been using. And the question is, is this thing always a subgroup of G? And if we're going to check if something is a subgroup, by the subgroup test, we would need to check closure and inverses. So let's check each of these things. So let's check closure first and then uh, inverses. And if it seems like it's going to work, then maybe we can do a formal proof. So for closure, we would need to have two elements that are in this thing. So let's say that we have an X and a Y that are both in this uh, potential subgroup here. So if that's true, then we know that we can write each of them as a to some power. So maybe I'll say x is a to the m and y is a to the n, where these uh, m and n are integers. So then what would x times y look like? Well, that would be a to the m times a to the n. And we know that that's the same thing as a to the m plus n. Just this is a bunch of a's m times in a row. This is a bunch of a's n times in a row. So this is a bunch of a's m plus n times in a row. And m plus n is an integer. So this is also in this set here. So closure seems to work. How about inverses? Well, for inverses, again, we'll need to say that we have some element that's in this potential subgroup here. And if that's in this set, we can say that x is a to some power. What about x inverse? Well, x inverse would look like a to the n inverse. Okay, so 
that's the same thing as a to the negative n. And negative n is itself an integer, so this is a to some integral power, and we can say, yep, that is also in this set, so inverses work. So it looks like we do have closure and inverses, so it looks like, yes, this is indeed a subgroup. And in fact, it is. And we can say that it's called the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. Now let's look at a formal proof. So here again is the notation we're using. And the theorem we have here is if G is a group and A is an element of G, then the uh, notation that we're using here is the little brackets around A, that is a subgroup of G. Remember we call it the cyclic subgroup generated by A. So first we have to check closure. So let X and Y be elements of this thing. Then we can write X and Y both as powers of A for some integers M and N. And so X times Y would be A times M and then A times N, which is the same thing as A to the M plus N. But then we know M plus N is an integer, so that means that X times Y is indeed in this set. So therefore, we can say that it's closed. Now how about inverses? So again, we'll let x be some element in this uh, potential subgroup here. So x is a to some power n, where n is an integer. So x inverse is a to the n inverse, and that's a to the negative n. But negative n itself is an integer, so x inverse is in the set. So by the subgroup test, we can say that this is indeed a subgroup of G. Let's look at one more example. How about uh, finding all of the cyclic subgroups of S3? So S3, if you remember, would be the set of symmetries on an equilateral triangle, and here is the group table for this. Okay, so we want to find all of the cyclic subgroups, so let's check each element individually. So the first one that we have here would be this row naught. So if we have row naught, and we want the cyclic subgroup generated by rho naught. Well, that's the identity element. And if you think about it, just applying powers of the identity is always going to give you the identity. So um, that's not a very exciting subgroup. It is a subgroup, but it's just uh, the one consisting of the identity. How about if we look at the cyclic subgroup generated by rho 1? So in this case, well, we know we would have rho 1. And rho 1 times row one is row two, so we know row two is in there, okay? And then if we do row one times row one times row one, well, that's the same thing as row two times row one, and that gives us the identity. And then things will start to cycle back, because then we'll have row zero times row one, will give us row one again, and so on. Uh, and so you can see why they call it a cyclic subgroup. You tend to cycle through the elements. So that's another subgroup. How about the cyclic subgroup generated by row two? So we start with row two. Row two and row two gives us row one. And then row two and row one gives us the identity. And again, we have the same subgroup. Okay, how about mu one? So now we can start with mu one. And mu one and mu one, that's the identity. So that's the identity, then that must be it, because then we would have the identity times mu1 would bring us back to mu1, and again, we would cycle back and forth here. So that's it. How about mu2? So mu2, I think, has a very similar structure here. Mu2 times mu2, that's the identity. So same idea. And I think if you look at mu3, you'll see the same thing here. It ends up just being mu3 and the identity. So this, these would be all the cyclic subgroups of S3.